Hi, I'm Dr. Younger, and I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. Today, I want to give you a brief update on the work I've been doing with resveratrol, and particularly, can resveratrol help chronic pain and chronic fatigue? So first, let me show you my normal disclosures. Here they are. And then I want to give you a couple of special caveats just for this talk. The first caveat is that I'm presenting work that was done in a very small group of individuals. I did this in only nine men. So this is definitely preliminary results. And anytime it's a pilot study or preliminary results, there's not enough data to be confident to make strong recommendations to the general population. So keep in mind that this is giving us hints as to what might happen with resveratrol, but we don't know for sure until we run it in a larger group. I am running it in a larger group right now, but I don't have the data from that yet. So in the meantime, here's the little kind of sneak peek of what it might do. So that's caveat number one. The second one is that I'm only looking at resveratrol for very specific reasons or for a very specific reason. There's a lot of uses for resveratrol and I'm not looking at those. And let me explain what I mean. So you, you've probably heard of resveratrol. It's a chemical that we uh, kind of classically attribute to red grapes, even though usually if you're taking resveratrol, it's usually not sourced from red grapes, but, but it is in red grapes. And so I, I remember like 20 years ago, there was a lot of talk about red wine having protective effects because there was resveratrol in it from the grapes, stuff like that. Um, but typically, when you're talking about medicinal use of resveratrol, it's usually not coming from consuming grapes or consuming red wine. It's typically from a supplement, which has much higher concentrations than you can get from eating raw foods or wine. Now, there's a lot of work in resveratrol. There are over 18,000 published scientific studies on this, uh, on the resveratrol. I think last year alone, there was 1,300 or, or more than that. It's been looked at for vascular health and high blood pressure and allergies, uh, obesity, glucose control, neuroprotective effects. So many applications, potential applications, things that have been tested. Now, when you look on social media, I did this over the past day or so, I can see that there's a particular use of resveratrol that seems to dominate the discussion, at least in the videos that I was finding. And that is with resveratrol as a potential agent for life extension or longevity. And that's via a protein called CERT1, which is um, sirtuin. And this protein has uh, control over metabolism and some really, really fundamental effects. I'm not going to go into that particular protein or how resveratrol might change that protein. And one of the reasons I'm not going to go into that is because that's not what I was looking at at all. And the literature is, um, I guess, controversial. And there's still a lot of scientific debate over if resveratrol hits the target, if it really has an effect, whether it works differently in the rodent models versus humans, if there's adverse effects. And I don't see that all that has been resolved. And aside, and besides that, it's outside of my area. That is not what I was looking at. So all the things I've mentioned a few minutes in the last couple of minutes, none of those are the reasons I wanted to look at resveratrol. I'm interested in resveratrol as an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant, like many of the other botanicals that I use. So this is about, can resveratrol reduce inflammation? Can it reduce pain? And can it reduce fatigue that's due to inflammation. And the reason I wanted to look at resveratrol is because there is, I think, credible evidence that it reduces C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are three major markers of inflammation that I'm interested in. So if there's a natural product that reduces those things, I'm interested in at least looking at it and testing it. So let's look at the paper and I'll show you uh, what, what it looks like in some actual human patients. Now, this is an open access paper, and that means you have full access to it. And there's a link to the paper in the description where you can get the full paper. So this was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. The long title is a placebo-controlled pseudo-randomized crossover trial 
of botanical agents for Gulf War illness. That's resveratrol, lutein, and fisetin. So I actually looked at three botanicals in this paper. So it was a clinical trial on three different agents. I'm not going to talk about lutein or fisetin. Those are two flavonoids or flavonoids that I also suspected might reduce inflammation. Uh, I may talk about those at another time, but definitely of those three, resveratrol had the strongest effects that I could uh, observe. So that's the only one I'm talking about today. Um, also on this paper, you see the authors. I'm senior author. Um, also the lead author is Kathleen Hodgins. Uh, Dr. Hodgin is a recent graduate of a medical psychology program. She was my graduate student, and now she's finished her dissertation defense, finished her internship, her clinical internship, and now she's going to start work in the VA system. And you can see the other authors as well. So here's the study. Again, very small sample size, nine men with Gulf War illness. I've talked about Gulf War illness before. It has elements in common with fibromyalgia and myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. So there's a lot of chronic pain, fatigue, cognitive disruption, and some other kind of chronic uh, immune effects. And we think it's due to exposures when these soldiers were sent over to the 1991 Persian Gulf War. What we did is we had them on baseline for 30 days. Then they were on placebo for 30 days. So they thought they were taking an active medication. Then they were on low-dose resveratrol for 30 days, and that was 200 milligrams per day. And then they were on high-dose resveratrol, which was 600 milligrams per day. Now, in terms of what we used for resver resveratrol, um, if you watch my talks, you know I do not ever uh, endorse particular products. That's just not what I do. I don't even like to mention trade names or companies. However, there's an exception, which is when I publish a paper, I'm obligated to divulge the source, of course. That's in case someone wants to know if I used a good source or if they want to replicate my study, they know how they can do exactly what I did. So since this is already published, I will tell you that the resveratrol that I used for the study was from Pure Encapsulations, and this is the Vesazor version that they have. So I use Pure Encapsulations in several of my projects. I'm not suggesting that they're the best source of, of the resveratrol. I have no idea. I've never tried to contrast and compare all the different products. This is just the one that met my criteria for the clinical trial. And so that's the one that I went with in this particular project. So let's see what happened. Here's our results. Now we're going to focus on resveratrol, which is on the left here. We've got four bars. These are representing Gulf War illness severity. So this is all the pain, fatigue, cognitive stuff, everything rolled into a single number. And so lower is better. Now we see four bars. The black bar is their baseline severity. Then the grayish bar is their placebo severity. Then the dotted bar is their low-dose resveratrol. And the hatched bar is the high-dose resveratrol. And so we're looking for a reduction for a clinical effect. So what we see here, uh, the first thing you can see is that there's a placebo response. So when they went from baseline to starting taking capsules, their severity reduced, even though they weren't taking an active botanical at that point, they were just taking uh, filler material. So there's no pharmacologic physiological action. This is the placebo effect, and that's perfectly normal. We expect to see that in any clinical trial. So the symptoms were reduced a bit by placebo. What we're looking for is, is there a second dip in, in symptoms when you move from placebo to low-dose resveratrol, which we did indeed see. There's a significant drop in their symptom severity when they started actually taking the resveratrol capsules. And then we see that when they move to the high dose, there isn't really a, a change. There's a very, very slight additional decrease, but it's not significantly different. So there's really no difference between the low dose and the high dose. So a couple of things to note uh, comparing to the other compounds that we tested. So, uh, you know, you can see that reduction from placebo to drug, which tells me that there's an act effect of interest. You can see that in context or in contrast to lutein, 
you can see that there's an expectancy of placebo drop, but then when they went from placebo to low dose, nothing changed. And that tells me that lutein doesn't really work in these individuals because there's no added effect. It stayed depressed or, or the symptoms stayed suppressed, I guess, but no better than expectancy. So this all looks like placebo. And this is why resveratrol looks like a, an actual effective botanical, whereas lutein in this case did not. Um, another thing I wanted to note that, let me see where this, yeah, I guess moving from low to high, you can see in the resveratrol that moving from low to high, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, moving from low to high didn't seem to confer any additional advantage. And that's really important uh, because, you know, the difference was 200 milligrams versus 600 milligrams. And there's a few reasons why this indicates you should stay at the low dose range at the 200 milligram range. First of all, 600 milligrams is three times as much every day than 200 milligrams, and resveratrol is pretty expensive. And so if you're going to take three times the resveratrol every day, that's going to cost three times as much. That's one reason why you don't want to take a high dose unless you have to. And the other concern is as you get higher in the dosage with any compound, you're going to increase the chance of side effects. And so if you stay on the lower end, like around 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams, you have less of a chance of developing side effects. Uh, for one example, as you get really high, like in the thousands of milligrams per day, there's a potential of uh, kidney effects in some individuals, so adverse kidney effects. But we didn't see that at 600 milligrams that we observed, um, but we didn't test it for a very long time. Now, 600 milligrams is generally considered to be safe. Uh, I think the dangerous dosage is around 5,000 milligrams a day, uh, so we're not suggesting you get anywhere close to that dosage. And I think there's enough evidence to suggest you shouldn't even get to 1,000 milligrams. And so again, this data is supporting what I've seen from several other studies, which is we should really be looking at around 200 milligrams a day. Another thing I wanted to mention is that I looked at pain and fatigue specifically, and I found that the resveratrol reduced pain, this is musculoskeletal whole body pain, kind of like fibromyalgia pain. So both the low and the high dose reduced overall body pain about the same amount. You can look at the paper if you want to see um, more about that. But I didn't see an, a really pronounced effect on fatigue. So again, like some of the other botanicals I've tested, in this group of men with goal for illness, some of these botanicals seem to work really well for pain but they don't seem to reduce fatigue as much. I will note that this group didn't have a whole lot of pain or a whole lot of fatigue either. So we might've found something different if we tried it in a primary pain or a primary fatigue group. We just don't know. So that's really the main thing I wanted to report. I'm keeping this pretty short again, since the data and the results are, are preliminary. I don't wanna make too many conclusions. I wanna wait until I have more data and then I can be more uh, confident in the conclusions I can make. So keep an eye on this one. There is some suggestion from the work I'm doing that resveratrol might be helpful if you have inflammation and you have kind of chronic musculoskeletal pain. And we'll have more to say about this uh, later. Now, what to do in the meantime? Gosh, you know, I over the past day, I kind of looked at YouTube videos to see what are people talking about now. And it looks like a rough place to get information on resveratrol. There's a lot of contradictory information. And unless you have a doctor online that you really trust, it's pretty tough to know which video or which YouTube people to, to trust and which ones you can't. And I don't know the answer to that. So uh, I think in general, I would not be making your medical decisions, including botanical usage, I would not be leaving that up to YouTube videos. I would go to your primary care physician and talk to them. You know, there are some clear potential risks with, with resveratrol because it's anti-inflammatory, like a lot of the agents I test. Uh, if you have blood clotting disorder, probably aren't going to want to take something that's going to further thin your blood and reduce clotting. If your blood pressure is really low, like a lot of the other uh, botanicals, it can reduce your blood pressure a little bit. And if it's already too low, 
that's probably something you're going to want to avoid. If you're taking a lot of blood pressure medications and you have labile blood pressure and sometimes you feel faint, this is probably one to avoid. And I've also seen um, papers suggesting that there's certain types of tumors. If you have them, uh, you may not want to take resveratrol. It may interfere with your therapy of those tumors. And there's lots of interactions with medications that you have to review before you take resveratrol. And the main point I want to make is even though resveratrol is, you know, comes from grapes, comes from other sources as well, but I'm just going to focus on the grapes. You know, even though resveratrol comes from grapes, once you've isolated a chemical from a fruit and you've turned it into a supplement, it's no longer a fruit. It's no longer a plant. At that point, it's a drug. Even if the FDA doesn't uh, label it as a drug, physiologically, it's a drug. Um, so don't treat it as an all natural product. It is a serious drug that you have to, even though you can pick it up at grocery stores and health food stores, it still needs to be checked uh, to make sure it's going to benefit some people and it will hurt other people like any other treatment. So please keep that in mind. Take it to your primary care physician, talk to them about it. They may say, oh no, you're taking this. No way. Um, or they may want to track something. They may want to track your kidney health. They may want to track your testosterone or your cholesterol. And if they want to track something to make sure that you can take resveratrol without any ill effects, uh, yeah, I'm all in favor of tracking things. So this is just one piece of information. It's, it's, a, it's interesting. It's intriguing. But we need to get more data. And I will be bringing that to you soon. So this is just a small piece of information. You know, take the data or the results I'm presenting you with and combine that with your other sources information before you decide if this is something you should um, take. So stay tuned here. Um, I think it's probably going to be into next year before we finished the larger trial. But as soon as we have the data, I will do a special talk and tell you, did we duplicate or replicate the earlier findings? And does it look promising? At that, um, at that time. So I'm going to put up for right now, I'm going to put up my earlier videos on curcumin and stinging nettle because I'm also testing those in large trials right now as well. So take a look at those if you haven't already watched those. And that's all I wanted to present for today. Just wanted to give you an update on one of the projects I'm running. So thank you for tuning in and I will be back on Monday with uh, another topic from our lab. I'll see you.